So welcome everyone uh, to our Bible study tonight, uh, term coveting the things of heaven. This is part one, which will give an, an overview of it all. Uh, part two hopefully will happen next week, where we'll look at the details of some of the things revealed tonight. So recent, recently we looked at the 11 distinct, distinctive fruits of the Spirit mentioned in the books of Galatians and Ephesians. In essence, the evidence of these fruits indicated the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within Christ's disciples. This was illustrated by the grasshopper in the jar representing the Christian in today's world. So you might remember that? Yes, we remember that. Good. So we also look briefly at the promises of Christ to his disciples. The promises in the scriptures are only to those who overcome Satan's lies and deceptions in this life. So in this I said, uh, it seems to me that when a Christian experiences the new birth, that his or her name is then placed upon a seat located near Christ's throne in heaven. So to, the, to the sons of God who overcome Satan's deceptions, together with his tests and his lies, Christ says he or she is seated with Christ in heavenly places. And it says here, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians 2.6. So we saw this, and there's the illustration of the seat, and most of us should remember seeing that illustration. Now, in the lesson last week, we also learned about the promises of Jesus Christ made to those Christians who overcome Satan temptations and his trials and his testings and persecutions. Now, these seven here are promises of Jesus to the overcomers that they will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, so that is in heaven. Uh, they shall not be heard of the second death, which is the lake of fire. Uh, and Jesus will give to them to eat of the hidden manna, and Jesus will give to the overcomer a white stone and in the stone a new name written. And Jesus will give power, meaning rulership, over the nations in Christ's millennial kingdom. And he will make a pillar, make that uh, individual a pillar in the temple of my God and Jesus will write upon him the new name that Jesus has for him or her. And he says that he will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame Satan's temptations and am set down with my father in his throne. So these are the precious promises that are in the future to everyone who overcomes Satan's temptations in this life and consider glory with Jesus in his throne, so just as Jesus uh, sat down with his father in his throne because he overcame. So with uh, foregoing promises of what we can expect to inherit in heaven one day, the message this week looks at the various spiritual gifts our creator has waiting for us in heaven for us to use now while on the earth. So if we look at a gift box, this is a worldly gift box, but we can sort of look at it as the Holy Spirit giving us his gifts and all we want to do is ask for them. So this is really what the uh, message is here tonight. Okay, so this claim is based around the following verses of Scripture. This is what this is all based on. So the question is, by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, do all have the gifts of healing? Well, the answer to that is no. Do all speak with tongues, unknown tongues? The answer there is no. Do all interpret an unknown tongue? The answer there again is no. So he's saying that covet earnestly the best gifts. 
Okay, the next one here says, Wherefore, brethren, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. So, so now that this is the message for tonight. So the following scripture verse tells us that it is wrong to worry about the cares of this world and to lust after, meaning to covet, the things of this world. Otherwise, focusing on such things will choke the will of God in the Christian's life. And those who succumb will become spiritually unfruitful towards God. Now, there's a scripture verse here which is repeated in the image below. It says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So this is really what I wrote up here uh, is reflected in this scripture verse, Matthew 13, 21 to 23. Now, I'd like to show you this image. I got it off the internet. Um, there's a little bit of uh, type that's here that's overwritten other type. It says, what is the condition of your heart? With a question mark. Then it's got these... Uh, this scripture verse reference here. And what I liked about it was an illustration of a weed. He is strangling or choking uh, a, a, a young plant of wheat. Mm. And Wonderful. this is this is really what it's all about. The deceitfulness of riches choking the word and he becomes unfruitful. So if this you know, plant here is killed by the weed, it can never produce any fruit. Okay, so I've got a subheading here called the dangers associated with covetousness. It says here that the following scripture verses reveal how sad it makes God when his people covet the things of the earth rather than the things of heaven. And in the Old Testament associated with the Jews and the prophet Micah, he said on behalf of God that, and they, meaning the Jews of Micah's day, covet fields and they take them by violence. So this is really the, high, the, the priests and the leaders, the uh, administrators of the Jewish communities. So they wake, make ways or find ways to take them by violence and they take people's houses and they take them away so they oppress a man and his house and even a man and his heritage. So this was a, a great, um, this has all come from the seed of covet, covetousness in a man's heart. And then in the second one here in Ezekiel, you don't need to read these out, but I'll just let you explain them briefly in a moment. It says, and they come unto thee as a people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. And with their mouth they show much love, meaning they say they love God, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So this is a, a real problem in humankind all the way along because we have a, an evil and a wicked heart. Because it says, for from within, out of the heart of the man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, and there's covetousness stuck in there, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and defile a man. Well, we've seen seen in earlier studies that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? So this is where covetousness comes from if the human heart is not brought in, into control. So what then must Christians covet instead? Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and these are waiting for everyone, every Christian in heaven, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. But this is the this is the most important thing to do is to cover earnestly the best gifts. Sorry, sound is too loud. Now, 
in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Now, it seems to me that coveting to prophesy is the most significant gift that we should covet. And it's probably speaking in tongues follows a close second. But um, I've only realised that this part here since I sat here ready to do the presentation. So let's just analyse what is the best gift. So following on from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, that's this one up here, okay? Prophesying appears to be the best gift. So uh, here is a command for all believers to covet earnestly the gifts. Now, um, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, and uh, Asma can look that up for me, it says, follow after charity. Now, charity means godly love or divine love. Okay, it's a very superior love. And you can find out what all that is in, in 1 Corinthians 13. And it says, And desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So obviously prophecy is the highest or the best gift. Okay, now the meaning of covet means eager rivalry. You know, it means that uh, you're not going to be outdone um, in the exercise of this gift and it's got strong passion for a thing okay and and uh, the Greek definition for covet is the same as to have zeal for something zeal is a really strong passion for something uh, a fervent mind it's also on the level of envy and jealousy these have neg negative connotations here in the Bible but it, it still illustrates the sort of uh, meaning for covetousness, you know, or coveting. Now, the, the third definition here for the best uh, gifts is that the stronger gift, the better gift, the greater gift, or the superior gift. That's what it all means. So all of this here is just an analysis of coveting earnestly the best gifts, okay? question here is why covet to prophesy? Now the scripture say, says that prophesying is the best gift as stated in 1 Corinthians 14, 39 above. So we've just read that. Yes. If we compare the gift of prophesying to say the gift of miracles where Christ changed large port, uh, water pots into wine that was mentioned in... Oops, that was mentioned in um, John 14, uh, 4, verse 46. And he says that Christians can say to a large mountain, be plucked up and be cast into the sea. I mean, these are huge miracles if you can fully appreciate it. In, that's how we understand things. We would say that's huge in our sense from a worldly point of view. But in from God's perspective, he says the prophesying is superior to doing any of these miracles. So this is the value that God puts on prophesying in the church. Okay? So that is what he calls the best gift. So all of these other things can still be done, like saying to a large mountain being plucked up and cast into the sea or changing or, or changing water into wine, but prophesying is far more pow powerful in God's kingdom. So let's uh, look at what are the spiritual gifts. And there's two sections here. One, The first one here is the eight gifts of God that he gives to Christians. So the first uh, gift that he gives is Christ. Now, in John 4.10, is the gift as living water, and he's also called the heavenly and the unspeakable gift in 2 Corinthians 9, and referred to as the heavenly gift in Hebrews 6. Now, we don't need to read all these out, otherwise we'll be here all night. But but if there is any that you particularly want to read out, then, then please say so. 
Um, the second one here is the Holy Spirit is promised to us. And it, and it says the word promise to us in Acts 2.33. Now, the Holy Spirit is gifted to us in Acts 2, and it's given conditionally, meaning you've got to meet the condition, and the condition is to them that obey him. So this is where we've got to obey the Holy Spirit. When he says to do something, we've got to do it, do that. And there's a verse of scripture that says, and it's a commandment to grieve not the Holy Spirit. So these are very important things to know and understand. So those are references about obeying the Holy Spirit. Now, God also gave Christians in the upper room the same gift of the Holy Spirit as he gave to the um, Christians in Cornelius's house. This is the Romans, the the Gentile Christians in the house of Cornelius. Okay, so this is the Holy Spirit who was promised and given. So the third gift is salvation, and it is termed the free gift of God. And that's I mean, mentioned uh, in Romans 5, verse 15 to 18, and it's termed the gift of God in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So those are the first three, the Christ, the Holy Spirit and salvation. The fourth is eternal life and it's termed the gift of God in Romans 6 verse 23. The fifth one is grace and it's referred to as the gift of the grace of God in Ephesians 3 verse 7. And it's termed grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ in Ephesians 4 verse 7. So the sixth one here, um, now this is broken up into another, a few different parts, but these are the spiritual gifts that God gives us and the Holy Spirit distributes among the people in the church. So... It's according to the grace given to us mentioned in t Romans 12, 6. These are the gifts that are distributed. Because we're not to come behind in no gift. In other words, if God has got gifts offered to us, we aren't to reject them or neglect them. Okay? So these are uh, issues associated with the spiritual gifts. Now, we'll speak about this in a moment, but there are diversities, administrations, and operations of the gifts. Um, that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. You'll see this in a minute. Um, then there are gifts that um, are given in the, the church. Firstly, the ministry of the apostles, then the prophets, then teachers, then there's miracles, healings, then there's helps and governments and the diversities of tongues. These are all ministries within the church that God has given the church as gifts. Amen. Okay, now, I thought here that I'd bring in t to some degree, helps doesn't really mean much up here, but from the Greek word here, it says it is a support or a help a succora or an aid. So we can just leave that out there. But somebody who's helping somebody else to do something important, that's really what it means. It says only in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 is it mentioned, and it refers to every kind of help God sets in the church. It cannot be limited to the work of deacons and deaconesses as some teach for there were other helps besides these in the church. So we won't read any of these, but if you want to look at the PDF later, you can do some research on those scripture references. All right. Well. Now, now, there are governments. We mentioned governments up here. So governments, that's the Greek word there, and it means a steering piloting or guiding so it's like guiding a ship into harbour you might need to steer it and you might need to pilot get a pilot to help guide you in so this is used only here and refers to all the means of guidance god has set in the church 
It has no reference to power of power to rule, but to men of extraordinary wisdom, knowledge and discernment to guide the church in all of its problems. So the gift of wisdom, knowledge and discernment of spirits are all involved in this ability of guidance. Amen. Wonderful. Now, now, there's a lot there. We can come back to this if you want people uh, something in the local language. So the next aspect of it is, is to ne ne neglect not the gift that is in thee. So this is in 1 Timothy 4. It's a commandment of the Apostle Paul to tell him to not neglect the gift that God, God has placed in him and also to stir up the gift of God that he has placed in him. That's in 2 Timothy, okay? And believers are to confirm God's words being preached using signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, that's various miracles, and the gifts of, using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So this is if, if you're preaching out in the open and you're uh, preaching to unsaved people, well, then God would like to confirm the words being preached using signs and wonders and even miracles to confirm the words so the people know that it's, it's God's people, the sons of God speaking to them, and they're not just words of men, that God himself will confirm the words being preached with the signs following that only he can do. So that's Amen. really what all of that is, that means there. And the ministers, uh, we are to minister the gifts among ourselves. That's what it says in 1 Peter 4.10. So the gifts aren't just for street preaching and performing the ministry. They're also here to help ourselves, particularly prophecy. But, you know, we often need healings as well amongst ourselves. So God's saying, well, use the gifts amongst yourselves as well. Now, there's eight gifts, there's eight uh, uh, spiritual gifts that God gives to Christians. So we look at seven, and uh, seven was ministers. So we had a look at this. Uh, no, we haven't looked at this. This is, and he gave some apostles, prophets, some evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why he's given us ministers, okay? Yes, and the final us, uh, one is that um, what the gifts are given for all good things. So God gives good things to his children who ask for them, and yes, I mean, the fruit comes from the gifts that um, he has given us, and every good and perfect gift comes from above. That's what it says in James 1 verse 17. Now, we'll look at the second part here. Up here was the first part, which was the eight gifts of God to Christians. The second part here is the nine distinctive gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it says here, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, meaning total profit. For to one Christian is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. And then it says to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith. And then by the same Spirit to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, so that's speaking in all types of different tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all Amen. these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So it means he, the Holy Spirit, he can distribute two, three, four different gifts to one person. He might dis distribute one or two to another. 
but that would be associated with the ministry that that man or that woman is going to perform. So there are the nine distinctive gifts that the Holy Spirit has offering to everyone who has become born again um, and who is striving to it or, had, yes, uh, they've strived to enter into the kingdom of heaven. They've become born again and now they want to produce fruit into God's kingdom. Well, then they need one or more of these nine gifts to be able to do the will of God and bring forth the fruit into God's kingdom. So that's what all of this really represents. So we can generally categorise the above nine gifts as follows. So they're broken up into three categories. The first is the word gifts. So we've got the word of wisdom, we've got a word of knowledge, and we have the discerning of spirits. And then we have the miracle gifts, which are faith, healing and miracles, and then we have vocal gifts, which are prophecy. These are, are spoken, so a word of prophecy, uh, someone speaking in a tongue and someone else interpreting the tongues. So I just thought, I thought I'd group them in those uh, categories. So the work of the divine trinity uh, we're looking at now because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together in the exercise of the spiritual gifts. So it says in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 and 6, it says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So this is very quite a powerful um, passage of Scripture, these three verses. But what it means is that the spiritual gifts are distributed to the sons of God by the Holy Spirit, and the operations of using these gifts are initiated by God the Father and it commences when it, he decides that he wants something done. So this is him exercising his will. So in Matthew 12, verse 50, it says, um, whosoever, Jesus says, whosoever doeth the will of my Father in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So that means that if we do the will of God, we know what the will of God is, and then we do it, well, then he, he arranges the operations of what we, we need to do. Now, the administrations are arranged by Jesus Christ as the great shepherd of the sheep to those of his sheep who hear his voice. So this is the way I, I, I have uh, presented it to you tonight, that the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts and he works with the people to ensure that when they're exercised, that the, the things happen that they're supposed to happen. Um, then God knows what gifts each um, of his children here or his sons of God have here on the earth. So then he might decide that he wants some evangelism done. That might originate in his will and he might say, well, I want the church in Lahore to go out and evangelise somewhere. So that's his operation. He's the man, if you like, the God who's organising what to do. And then Jesus arranges the administrations by he will go forth and lead his sheep um, and those who hear his voice. That's the way I see all of this happening through this verse of Scripture here. Um, we're talking about here born-again Christians who are termed the sons of God, and they're not really sons of God unless they're able to demonstrate the gifts of the Spirit, okay? Now, Jesus turned water into wine, which was the gift of miracles, okay? Um, and he talked to the woman at the well and told her all that had ever happened to her, which was that she had been married to four other husbands and the husband that she had now was the fifth. So that was the word of knowledge. So 
these are spiritual gifts, uh, the, the diversities of gifts. So Jesus exercised the nine. He had the nine gifts that he operated in his ministry. But he, he didn't do them himself. He used the Holy Spirit to exercise those gifts. So there right. are the administration. So God the Father would have said to him, Jesus, go and do this, and Jesus would have had the gifts to have, done, to have done that. So God the Holy Spirit would have been working with God the Father to allow Jesus to do the miracles or the word of knowledge, whatever it was. And uh, this, this is what this is to some degree saying. The thing is here that we're looking at us here on the earth as sons of God, which is different to the being the Son of God. So the spiritual gifts are distributed by the Holy Spirit. The operations, meaning he's telling Christians in one church to go and do one, uh, you know, one, uh, one job, if you like, that is the will of God. And he might tell God the Father might want Christians in another church to do something different. So... God the Father is organising it through operations, if you like, but to administer the operation, Jesus Christ does that as the great shepherd of the sheep to those of his sheep who hear his voice. So the born-again Christian is like a sheep who hears the voice of the great shepherd and they follow him where, wherever he goes. Do you understand that? Uh, now we'll look at the uh, ten ministries of the Holy Spirit, and meaning these are ways that he manifests himself in this world, okay? So his aim, his first aim here is that he will glorify Jesus in everything that he do. So the Holy Spirit takes no glory for himself. He doesn't attract any worship to himself or any prayer really. Basically, he wants uh, people to glorify Jesus in the name of Jesus. So that's the first one. So the second one is that he initiates or inspires spiritual manifestations. So this is, these are the gifts when they're working through God's people. Uh, the Holy Spirit baptizes the sons of God into the body of Christ in the church. Okay, so as a new believer comes into the church and he gets saved, he gets born again um, after he's uh, strived to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Once God knows that he is uh, looking to produce fruit, he then gets baptised into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now, the fourth one is that he refreshes believers. You know, we can always uh, get a bit weary during our uh, journey through this life. Um, the Holy Spirit will refresh us uh, when we get tired. Uh, he, the next manifestation is that he imparts love to his people and others uh, through his people. Uh, the sixth one is that he speaks mystery in tongues. And the seventh one is that he interprets the mysteries that are, have been uttered in tongues. The eighth one is that he edifies the body of Christ by prophecy. The ninth one is that he edifies believers in tongues. That means just on your own. Um, there can be times when you break into a tongue and he can just edify you without um, anybody else knowing what's happening. And the tenth one is that he gives gifts to believers. So these are the ten different ways the Holy Spirit manifests himself in the lives of believers. So this is a summary. Therefore, we can safely assume the following points from the foregoing statements that we saw in Scripture. Now, no Christian can bring the required fruit into God's kingdom as a branch grafted into Jesus unless he or she uses one or more gifts of the Holy Spirit that are needed to perform the ministry that Christ has appointed unto them. So the one or more gifts are needed to perform the ministry and 
um, and that ministry, when performed, will produce the fruit that God requires from the branch that's been grafted into Jesus. So all Christians who have a known ministry and the gifts operating with that ministry must join with other like-minded Christians in their ministries to become members, members of the body of Christ, as shown below. So if somebody has an eye ministry, we could regard an eye ministry as being prophecy. So the, that eye ministry should have the gift of prophecy. It could have a gift of tongues. It could also have the gift of interpretation of tongues. So, you know, you can look at it that way. Um, a foot ministry um, would have diff a different set of gifts. We, You know, this would be one maybe that uh, helps with the, the preaching of the gospel, just like the, the hand ministry might have different gifts as well. But the idea is, is that all of these ministries have one or more of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in each one. And as you can see there, um, I've used a, uh, the image of a good soldier of Jesus Christ in each one of these ministries. That means that somebody, no, I didn't. But it means that somebody's matured from being a babe in Christ to being a, a young uh, a, a youth, you know, a young man, and then a father, and then matured up to become a good soldier of Jesus Christ in that ministry. So the third point here is the Christians within the particular body of Christ. That means the church in that area. You know, of course, we're supposed to have multiple churches everywhere. So the various Christians within that particular church must regularly evangelise their local communities. Christians must also pray and fast regularly and together. So it means the whole church must call a day of prayer and fasting regularly, maybe once a week, once a fortnight, and, uh, and they all do it together. Okay. So the fifth one is that Christians must be seen to oppose the enemy of mankind, which is Satan and his demons. And that can happen in various ways. Um, the sixth one is that if Christians have not received any of the gifts, right, because they haven't asked for them or they don't want them, it is doubtful they will become fruit-producing wild olive branches that have been grafted into Jesus. So what I say is, is that every Christian who becomes born again is like a branch grafted into Jesus from which God the Father expects to see spiritual fruit produced from that branch. Um, but if the branch isn't exercising the gifts of the Spirit or, um, you know, is strayed and, and just not interested in that type of thing, then they can't produce the fruit that God requires as a branch grafted into Jesus. So, so the, here Jesus says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, meaning God the Father, taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth. That means he keeps pruning it back, right, because it's a fr good fruit-producing branch, so he keeps pruning it back so it'll produce more fruit, okay? Produce more fruit. And then it says in this next uh, passage here, these three verses in Romans, for if the first fruit, now Jesus was the first fruit um, of the resurrection, but saying that if, but he came first, he's, he's the Lord from heaven. So if the first fruit be holy, because Christ is, is holy, then it says the lump, which meaning means the fruit that comes from the vine, so it's the fruit that every branch grafted into Jesus produces, is also holy. And if the root, this means Christ, who's planted in God's kingdom, be holy, so are the branches. This means the Christians grafted into the vine. So holiness is vital in every Christian. It then says, and if some of the branches be broken off, 
this means the rebellious Jews, um, but it means anybody else too. And thou, meaning the Gentile Christian being a wild olive branch or a tree, it says here, being grafted in among them, meaning the Jewish branches, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the natural or the Jewish branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, meaning Jesus Christ, but the root bearest thee, meaning the branch. So I hope you've been able to understand the structure of this tree here. You can't see the roots, but the ground along here represents the kingdom of God. Jesus is the vine and he's got his roots rooted in the kingdom of God. I've always seen this here as the sap that comes through the vine and the branches being the Holy Spirit, you know, moving his way through each and every branch that's in the vine. And so between Christ, who's the vine and the branch being grafted in, the Holy Spirit being the sap that moves through the, the branches, this then produces the fruit that hangs off the vine or the branches. So this is what God's expecting. God the Father comes along and expects all the branches to see if they've got any fruit for him, just as any orchardist would do. And if the, if the tree or the vine continually fails to bear fruit, he'll ultimately cut it down. So, in summary, then these are the last words. Uh, we are to covet the guest, best gifts, and that means to covet the things of heaven. Because by doing that, each Christian, through the operation of the gifts from heaven, will eventually result in the storing up of the treasures in heaven for themselves. It's sort of like if we work hard and we earn money and we put the money in the bank here, when we need the money, we can go to the teller machine and withdraw some of the um, some of the uh, money that we've created by through our work, and it works exactly the same in heaven.